a seat. Who do you think you are? Where is your identity rooted? What is it that defines you? Where do you belong? After you ask, what's my place in the grand scheme of things? It's the heart, isn't it, of the, the teenage angst, really, working out who we are, where we sit in the pecking order. Obviously, lots of messed up ways that teenagers go about working that out. I found it interesting that this week the government is considering a ban on smartphones for all under 16s. Isn't that interesting? Of course, it's not just teenagers. That carries on through into young adulthood and, and probably further on. Stop and think. Who we are, who we think we are, our identity, that drives much of, of how we behave, what we prioritise, how we see ourselves, our self-worth, our culture, lots of voices, mostly unhelpful, mostly confusing. So what is it? Where is your and my identity rooted? Is it ethnicity? Is it class? Is it education, possessions, sexuality? Is it gender? Who would you say you are? Where do you root your identity? Well, Ezra chapter 2 is a list of names, okay? It is a list of names. If you've read it like I suggested last week when you read through, you probably thought, what are we going to do when we get to Ezra chapter 2? Definitely forgiven for asking that. Why this tedious list in the Bible? When, uh, obviously, over the years I've, I've been trained to, to do preaching and some teachers say this is a text that will preach and often they're referring to a New Testament letter you know Philippians or 1 Thessalonians or Colossians because it's straightforward or James do you remember that you read it you, yes and you'll go home with a warm fuzzy thinking I'm going to do that that's better I'm, I'm better about that I doubt whether they would say of Ezra chapter 2 this is a text that will preach which means that we're going to have to work we are going to have to work today now, it isn't, is it, the first list in Ezra? Do you remember last week, those that were with us, the inventory of pots and pans? It's very interesting in home group when I asked, uh, what, 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 what do you thought of Ezra chapter 1? Quite a number said, that list of pots and pans, what was that about? But what a powerful teaching point it was, wasn't it? How God does his God stuff with such panache. There's Nebuchadnezzar. He's making this arrogant list of, of all the precious spoils. He's grandstanding his collection of gold and silver that he's nicked from the temple. What a big man I am. Look at all this loot I've nicked. I'm going to put it in my temple of Marduk. My God's better than your God, Israel. Look, we've got all your loot now. But God, he's just got this wry smile on his face. God's just pleased that, that Nebuchadnezzar's handy list is going to turn into an inventory. So helpful when in 48 years' time, all that loot is going to be counted back out and taken back to Jerusalem. God's just smiling, because instead of it going into, into a storage unit where it will get all dusty, he's helpfully put it in a temple where some priests, okay, not the right priests, but some priests are dusting it and keeping it all shiny. Brilliant. God's chuckling at Neb's arrogance. Little does he know he's only a caretaker. God's plans never, ever thwarted by human thugs, just pawns. Lists can tell us so much. I do want us to be excited about Ezra chapter 2. I'm going to do my very best, my very best. Because you see, Ezra chapter 2, it is a monument to God's care of his people. Ezra chapter 2 tells you and me all we need to know about that confusing and that taxing question of who am I? That Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for every single letter and number of your word. And I pray that as we, we look at it together now, you would use these words, these names, these numbers, this collection, to stir our hearts by your spirit. For we ask it in your precious name. Amen. 
um, Steve said, we're Ezra chapter 2, um, beginning at verse 1, can be found on page 473 of your church Bibles. Page 473, Ezra chapter 2. Now these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to their own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilchan, Mizpah, Bigvi, Rehum, and Barna. The list of the men of the people of Israel the descendants of Parosh, 2172, of Shephatah, 1245, of Zatu, 945, of Zakai, 760, of Bani, 642, of Bibai, 42, of Kiriath Jerim, Kefira and Biroth, 743, of Rama and Geba, 621, of Mikmash, 122, of Bethel and I, 223, of Nebo, 52, of Magbish, 156, of the other Elam, 1254, of Harim, 320, of Lod, Hadid and Ono, 725, of Jericho, 345, of Senna, 3630. The priests, the descendants of Jediah, through the family of Jeshua, 973, of Imma, 1052, of Pashur, 1247, of Harim, 1017. The Levites, the descendants of Jeshua and Cadmiel of the line of Hodaviah, 74. The musicians, the descendants of Asaph, 128. The gatekeepers of the temple, the descendants of Shalom, Atta, Talmon, Akub, Hatita, and Shobai, Sisera, Tima, Neziah, and Hatifar. The descendants of the servants of Solomon, the descendants of Sotai, Hasafereth, Peruda, Jala, Darkon, Gidel, Sheftiah, Hatil, Pukareth, Hazabayim, and Amy. The temple servants and the descendants of the servants of Solomon, 392. The following came up from the towns of Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Kerub, Adon, and Imma, but they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. The descendants of Deliah, Tobiah, and Nakoda, 652. And from among the priests, the descendants of Habiah, Hakoz, and Barzillai, a man who had married a daughter of Barzillai the Gileadite, and was called by that name. These searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there was a priest ministering with the Urim and Thummim. The whole company numbered 42,360, besides their 7,337 male and female slaves, and they also had 200 male and female singers. They had 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. When they arrived at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the families gave free will offerings towards the rebuilding of the house of God on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury for this work 61,000 darics of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. The priests, the Levites, the musicians, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants settled in their own towns, along with some of the other people, and the rest of the Israelites settled in their towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel and his associates, began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, 
they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as free will offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. Thank you very much indeed. So, back to our question, who am I? Ask a Jew in Ezra's time, someone who came from Judea originally, ask them what their identity was. They would say something like this, look, I belong to the people of God, that is who I am. The great and true God, Yahweh, has chosen a people for his own possession and glory to bring his light to the world. And I belong to that people. This God has entered into a covenant relationship with us and we belong to him. Though our sin has caused our exile. That's what they would say. Identity mattered. If you did miss last week, uh, we did an intro, the history of God's people and why they're here in Babylon. Can I say, it's 100% essential to understand what's going on in Ezra to, to pick up that history. If you missed it get, it, get it on our YouTube channel. You won't get Ezra without it. Also, those sheets are produced a kind of one-page summary of how we get to the New Testament. Um, I didn't print enough last week. I, Ali asked me to print some more. I printed some more, and I know some of you didn't, still didn't get one. I'll print some more next week. So uh, if, you, if you didn't get one, I'm sorry about that. So back to asking a Jew in Ezra's time who they really are, what define them. There can be no blurred edges, no uncertainties about belonging or not. No doubt, because for these people, all their future hopes, everything, were wrapped up in their identity. And that is why we need Ezra chapter 2. More than anything else, in their lives, trumping everything, their identity depended on their relationship with God. And we see that towards the end of this section, so we'll come back to that. So no, no matter how tough it has felt for them in exile, not a jot of difference to the reality of God's saving work, his saving plan. God is still 100% committed to his people. You see, it was their God that, that organised through Cyrus, supervised, enabled, protected and provided for them as they returned to Jerusalem, to that devastation with that job to do. And, and remember God's panache, the most unlikely candidate to, to be God's agent, Cyrus. God has organised that too. And next surprise, not only can they go home, but they go home funded by their non-Israelite community. It's the non-Jews that are buying their flights, organising their finances, and, and sending them home with a nice little, little nest egg. See, you can't make it up. You ever find yourself doubting God's grace to his people, doubt his hand? Ezra, all the evidence that we need, writ large. So, this list of names, ready to tackle it? Honestly, if you... If the person next to you starts to snooze, poke them. Um, I'll do my best, but, you know, let's tackle it. It's God's word. Not, not with a, a sigh. Let's not do it with a sigh. It's powerful detail. And trust me, you, you are going to have to work, though. You are going to have to work. But you won't regret it, I promise you. So let's take the first 11 that we get in verse 2. Now, these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, ne Nehemiah, Zeriah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispah, Bigvi, Rehum, and Banna. 
Ezra's already listed Shezbazar in chapter 1, verse 8. There are 11 names added there. 11 plus 1 equals 12. 12 leaders. Those names represent the 12 tribes of ancient people of God. This is shiver down spine moment for those people, for those exiles, that remnant coming back, suddenly God's restoring. It's quite a moment, actually. Hugely significant. We're not used to this identity stuff so much in this country and this culture, but it's big for them. They tell us all we need to know, those names, about what God is doing. He's reconstituting. He's restoring what once was. God had not forgotten his promise. God God had not given up on them. God is taking them home again, just as they were. Shiver down the spy moment for God's people. God's putting the 12 tribes back in place. Next up, we get a long list of names in 3 to 35. That's all I'm going to do about it. Don't worry, we're not reading them all. So why so many names? Names otherwise forgotten. Names that I'm sure Jim will attest are hard to read out in church. Well, we believe, don't we, that God never wastes a single letter of his word. If you and I are struggling with a part of the Bible, guess who needs to do the extra work? Start to down the path of weighing up whether this bit of the Bible is any good. That is a slippery slope, isn't it? It's a slippery slope. God's word. It's there for a reason. So the list, not a bunch of names just lumped together, but relational groupings. Did you notice that? Local and family circles. Things that effectively humanize society. God is saying in that list of names, people matter to me. People matter to me. Most of us, in the eyes of the world, we're we're not terribly significant. Few of us are a household name. Few of us, in a worldly sense, will be remembered. Have you ever tried Googling your name? Thought I'd give it a go yesterday, so here we go. Page one, well, top of page one, next bit, no, next bit, no, next bit, no, that's now, is that the bottom of the page? I think it is, yeah. I went for 11 pages further on, guess what? Nothing, nothing at all. Got bored. Nothing except an Australian rugby league player who's practically on every page. A magician that occasionally appears in a lot of obituaries, actually. So, do you know what? Ezra chapter 2 says something very different. Ezra chapter 2 says, what are you bothering with that for? What a load of nonsense. Google might not know your name, but God does. Don't worry about Google, because your name is listed with God. Ezra 2 says to you and me, if you're a Christian, if you belong to God, you may never be famous. You might not make it into secular world history. But, and it is a massive but, you'll not be forgotten by God. Every individual, every son, every daughter of God matter. That's why he lists them all. It's telling you God cares about you. He knows you by name. Speaks volumes, doesn't it, of God's unstinting commitment. In New Testament terms, it's our adoption, some of what we've been looking at at the beginning of the service. Sinclair Ferguson puts it like this. The notion that we are children of God, his own sons and daughters, is the mainspring of Christian living. Our sonship to God is the apex of creation and the goal of redemption. In other words, you might be a nobody in this world, but Ezra 2 tells you the God of entirety, that God who orders every moment of every day that has ever happened and will ever happen, that God knows precisely who you are. He has your back. He knows you by name. He has your name written down. So who are you? God knows precisely who you are. You are his precious daughter, his precious son, if you're a Christian. Next up, 
Ezra lists the priests, the Levites, the church band, the wardens and the welcome team and everyone else who serves in the church. That's the verses 36 to 58. Again, we're not going to look at them all, but do the maths and just the priests alone, they represent 10% of those who went back, 10% of the remnant of exiles that went back to Jerusalem. I.e., there's a priest for every 10 people. And that's not to mention all the other full-time staff that, that, that are listed. Now, all saints, although it doesn't look like it's I'm stood here now, apparently it's around about 150 people. So that's about 15 of me. Actually, that's a nasty thought. Let's think 15 of Chris Tom. Don't want to put you off your lunch. You've got 15 Chris Toms. That's better, isn't it? The Levites are those who directly assisted the priests. And from the tribe of Levi, hence their name, the temple servants, they're the assistants to the Levites, much the same as the descendants of the servants of Solomon. So that's how the sort of pecking order works, if you like. So why so many? Why do we have so many going back? Well, as God organises the return from exile, there's nothing casual about the preparation. Israel is a holy nation. Israel... I've got a massive task of bringing the light of God to the world. From them will come Jesus Christ himself one day, the right-hand side of that sheet. So they have a substantial calling. They need to be attending to their spiritual life. That has to be the most important thing for them. And so no risks are taken whatsoever. I wonder if you notice the little detail, 59. The following came up from the towns of Tel Malar, Tel Harsha, Kerob, Adon, and Imma. But they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. The descendants of Delilah, Tobiah, and Nekoda, 652. And from among the priests, the descendants of Hobiah, Hakoz, and Barzillia, a man who had married a daughter of Barzillia, a, the Gil, Gileadite, and was called by that name. These searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there was a priest ministering with the Urim and Thummim. No uncertainty could be allowed. Clarity was needed as to whether the person was legit or not. No fence sitting, no priest could operate. If there's any uncertainty that they might have married a non-Israelite. But these details about fa family records, they tell an even bigger story. They tell us that bringing salvation to the world... That task they've got is, is such an important task that God's given these people. These people to be a holy people, set apart for himself, and seeking to follow his word, to rule his rule as his redeemed people. There has to be a clarity around who they are. The task is too important. And that's what all this little detail about their family records not being found is all about. Now, that is them then, isn't it? But it is, of course, us now. There's no difference, is there? We have to have a clarity of purpose for all of us. Here's Paul writing to the Corinthians. Nope, I've suddenly lost control of my slides. Okay, I've got it back. Thank you. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though Christ were making his appeal through us. A Christian community is to be distinct from the world, is to live differently, be a place of reconciliation and forgiveness. That's where that text is taken from. He talks of the Christian community being the fragrance of Christ to those around. So God's people and God's community must live and behave differently to the world. A holy people. Not the same as our workplace, or our school, or our office. Clarity of purpose for us, for all of us, but clarity of purpose for my role too. To lead us as a church that proclaims Christ, a church that's rooted in his word. I have to teach 
even the unpopular bits and lists of names. My role has to be to put a higher priority on the wider tasks of God's ministry through all saints than anything else. So as tempting as people-pleasing is to all of us, I'm actually not here to please you. My role is to prioritise all that leads to us becoming mature disciples. And sometimes I won't please you when I do that, and you won't please me when you help me with that. So the details in this list show us clarity of task matters to God. Now, the overall number of returnees was not huge, about 50,000 people. And they might have expected, more, even more conservatively counted, at least double that. So what happened to the rest of them? Why so few? Perhaps some decided that, that they were too old or too unwell to travel. Others, maybe, they'd put down their roots in Babylon. They were just too comfortable to move. The thought of, of all that lay ahead too much, not prepared for the spiritual challenge of that, that journey the difficult and challenging task of, of rebuilding and resettling in Judea. A similar choice repeatedly confronts us as Christians compared with Hebrews 11, 8 to 27. And may form a test between nominal and real believers. God does not always call us to security. Well, chapter 1, do you remember it ended with that brilliant cliffhanger from Babylon to Jerusalem. That is a massive turning point in history. They were taken from Jerusalem into exile in Babylon, from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Chapter 2 verse uh, carries on like this. Verse 68. When they arrived in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, boom, they've got there. That's an amazing sentence, isn't it? Some of the heads of the families gave free will offerings toward the rebuilding of the house of God in its, on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury for this work 61,000 drachmas of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. The priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants settled in their own towns along with some of the other people, and the rest of the Israelites settled in their towns. They've arrived. What is the first thing they do? The first thing they do, they give. Now, doubtful we'd have expected that. They've been longing to get home, back to Judea. Generations of captivity in Babylon. Finally, this much-awaited return. The moment is there. They've arrived in Jerusalem. The exiles are back. First thing they do, they sort out their giving freely. Now, I may be particularly mean-spirited, but it's hard to imagine that that would be my go-to at that point. Challenging, isn't it? And it isn't complicated, is it? How do I feel about my giving to building the house of God now? It's not about bricks and mortar now, but about people. The gospel work of our church is your and my equivalent. How do we feel about that? Look at how they approached it. And it's a sign of health, isn't it, of any enterprise when people give freely towards it, when people feel passionate about it. You may know that I make it a policy that I have no knowledge what any of you give on a monthly basis. That's absolutely crucial, I don't know that. But from time to time, freely, people give towards the ministry in a way that I can't miss. So the recent ongoing refurb of the building, an enormous gift given cover that. The furnishing of the youth room, examples that, that spring to mind. Signs of, of spiritual health in those members. They want to freely and sacrificially give to the gospel building task. Those returning people were given lots of cash by their neighbours. Do you remember? And the government also gave them a grant to rebuild the temple. Now, they could easily have thought, well, look, there's a government grant from Cyrus. No need for me to give anything. Official grants can actually lead to complacency, really, can't they? Knowledge that others in our fellowship are giving to cover the cost of running our church. Maybe that's today's equivalent. Oh, I'll leave the giving to the wealthy members, we might think. 
These people gave willingly, not duty, not, not to keep the law, not, not just what they were told to give. Most of them had never even seen Jerusalem before. Different generation. Now they're there. They show their thankfulness to God straight away. The gold that they gave weighs a staggering 515 kilos. I looked up the price uh, of gold on a website. It was called Bullion by Post. I thought to myself, that's going to make the postie's cart quite heavy, isn't it, if you buy bullion by post? Anyway, that amount at the price at about 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon, they pride themselves bullion by post by updating the price every five seconds. So I, of course, watched to see if that was true. didn't change much, but it did a bit. So about 2 o'clock, that comes to 33 million quid. 33 million that didn't include the silver. I didn't look up the price of the silver, which was even more. Now, did you notice that some were able to give substantially, others only a little? But as they all give what they can give, it adds up to a staggering amount of money for God's mission. This is not just then either, is it? Look at this building that we're in. Look around you at it a little bit. Take a moment, just look at the windows the pillars, the ornateness of it. When we were, were sort of starting on the work for the youth room, I met with an architect, the diocesan architect, and uh, uh, we had plans of the building. And uh, he was looking at those, and he was referring to the fact that, that part of the building work, he said, oh, well, this building's had some very recent, very modern building work done, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. He was referring to these aisles, north and south. I think that's north. Anyway, whatever. That, those two aisles, okay? Either side of the pillar, basically. That didn't exist before. It stopped there, and then these aisles were added on. Do you know when the, this modern addition, this very recent addition was added? 1870. <laughs> but that apparently it, it re, reconfigured my whole understanding of what recent is when you're talking about ancient buildings. This building, the most ornate, the best building in the village. There'd be no stained glass in the village's cottages. Churches up and down the country, aren't they the biggest, the grandest, the most beautiful buildings in their villages and towns? Why is that? Because that's where the people of the village invested. That's where they it's the same, you see, as these people returning to Jerusalem. The temple was a symbol of God's presence among them and with them and what made them a distinct people that they were. So they had no issue in making it their best. My quiet times, I've also been looking at Ezra and uh, the writer of the notes took, took us to Mark chapter 12. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people, me, bleh, new teeth, many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put everything, all she had to live on. Jesus has a way, doesn't he, of clarifying things. The writer of the notes drew us, drew us out to Jesus' very clear point. Jesus is not interested in... God's not interested so much in how much we give, but the real measure of generosity, actually how much we keep. I wonder, when did you and I last prayerfully review our giving through the, the, the parish giving scheme? So, with all this cash, you might have thought a posh city firm of architect, architects would have been emailed, and some ladies and gents in some, some designer suits with their laptops are on site in Jerusalem within the end of the week. Chapter 3, very much the teaser for what happens next. Because, you see, on our theme of identity, knowing who you are will determine what you prioritise. So let's see what they prioritise. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. 
Then Jeshua, son of Josedek, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates, began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. Now, I've not done a lot of building work in my time, but I'd have thought the starting point would be the foundations. Wouldn't you start there? Does it strike you as a little bit odd that they start with the furniture? That's the first thing they attend to, the furniture. What is that about? Why start with the altar? Very simple. These returnees know full well the reason why they were in exile. Their faithlessness, their sinful turning away from God. They know full well, therefore, before they lay down these physical foundations, they absolutely must, absolutely must, lay down spiritual foundations. They must be right with God first. Their ceremonial means of atonement, we read it there, it's all strange to us, but it has to be the starting point if they had to depend on their God. Nothing has changed. Nothing is actually more important in our lives than to worship and serve the living God. Well, as we finish, here's this week's cliffhanger. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not been laid. I assume they're just out there in the open. It's like having no roof or walls, and here we are, just sat here. The altar was built in 537 BC. The foundations didn't start till 536 BC, a whole year after they arrived in Jerusalem. Do you see how they prioritised worshipping God first? Is that incredible? I think we'd be straight on with the building, wouldn't we? So, who are you? God knows precisely who you are. You are his precious daughter. You are his precious son. And knowing who you are, that will determine what you prioritise. That list of names in Ezra 2 tells you that, that that essential identity, not from your ethnicity, nor your class, nor your possessions, nor your education, nor your gender, nor your sexuality. It tells you that whilst your name may never come up on Google, your name is much, much more precious than that. It tells you that God knows precisely who you are. He knows you by name, always has. It tells you that if you're a Christian here today, your identity comes from being in Christ, from being God's precious son, God's precious daughter. That is a richer identity than any human label. Far richer. How is knowing that going to change your priorities this week? How you see yourself? this month, this year. Let's take a moment to think about that and then Anne is going to pray for us.